There are more than 100 medicines on the Pharmac waiting list. Some have been there 5, 10 or even 15 years. I interviewed the chief executive of Pharmac, Sarah Fitt, and asked her whether she was comfortable with that. Well, if there's other medicines have come along and replaced it, uh, if there's not a supplier in the country, we can't supply it. So it, historically, we've never declined ap we applications. We've kept applications open in case new evidence comes or the pricing changes. But I think that the feedback we've got from people is they'd rather have some certainty. So rather it, that it's sitting on a list for a long time and not moving out anywhere, we'll be moving to decline them. But the one that's been sitting there the longest is an EpiPen. I mean, that's not some you know, uh, fringe sort of medicine, is it? That's no, but we fund we fund adrenaline um, as the ampule, so there is a product that is actually available that yep, is funded. But you don't fund the EpiPen, the means of actually transmitting the adrenaline into mm -hmm. the body, do you? But we fund the, we actually fund the adrenaline ampule, so there is a, an option there for people. Because Pharmac has a capped budget, it has to free up money in order to fund new medicines. Now, one of the key ways it does that is by putting the supply of drugs out to tender. If it gets a cheap price from the drug company, the patient may be forced to switch brands to a cheaper generic form of the drug. So we do that very carefully and we, we, it's not something we do lightly. But you do it all the time. You do it 60 times a year. Yeah, but some of those things have changed brands multiple times. The, the, the brand, the tender runs every sort of three years, so something might have changed three or four times. But for the first time we do it, we've, we don't even put it in the tender till we've got clinical advice as to whether that's appropriate. But you're do doing it. it for mental health patients. Yes, yes. And that's based on the advice we get from our psychiatrists and our clinicians as to whether it's appropriate to do it. Or well, not. we wouldn't do it if the advice was not to do it or if there was a risk. Yeah, but you're doing it. You're doing it to save money, aren't you? Well, it frees up money to spend on, on new medicines. Yeah, I mean, you shifted 45,000 people mm -hmm. with serious mental illnesses to a new form of antidepressant. Well, it was, it's exactly the same antidepressant. It's the same chemical. It's a different yeah. brand. Yes, but it's a, it's a generic, isn't yes. it? Yes, and we, we thought about that long and hard, and it was something that we planned for for a long time. We got a, a lot of clinical advice before we did that. So we take this very, very seriously. We don't want to cause harm to people at all. No, but um, you had 142 reports in a year of adverse side effects from that, didn't you? Out of 45,000. Yeah, but 142 yes. people. Yes. So we, we worked very closely with MedSafe. We monitored um, the reports we were getting. Gee, we that's a big risk to take to save some money, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's, it, it was something that we, as I said, we... we Took very, we take it very seriously, we get clinical advice, we have a very comprehensive implementation plan, we involve primary care, pharmacists, uh, the psychiatrists. Are you confident that, that no one harmed themselves or no lives were lost in that switch? Well, it, it's still going on, so we, we get that advice and we watch it very well, well, carefully. Well, tell me what it's, what, can, you, can I repeat the question? Are you, are you certain that that no one has harmed themselves or, or, lo or even taken their lives because of the switch. I can't be certain. I don't know all the individual details of those 142 cases, but we monitor it very, very carefully. And obviously, if there was any issues of concern, um, we would have acted on that. But have you been advised of any of No. Pharmac makes a ranking list of which medicines it wants the most, but it's a secret list, so patients never know when or if the medicine will be funded. Well, we can never give a date. I mean, it's it's always dependent. So why, why not? Well, because it's like any time when you've got a, a capped budget, you're always looking at what savings you can make. That frees up the headroom. We can work down yeah, the list. But you say that, but, you know, I mean, isn't it fair to be able to say to people, look, we will make a decision on this at X point. We will well, we don't you. know. We, we don't know when we'll have the money available to be able to... Because the thing is, you don't just fund it for one year. Once we fund it, we fund it forever. So we have to be sure that we have the money going out. That's what our prioritisation, our ranking does. It stacks up what actually is going to... But we don't know what the ranking is either, no. do we? Why not? Because it's the most commercially sensitive bit of information we have. Why? Because that acts as our leverage um, companies. So the leverage comes before... Well, because if they know that they're high on the list, they're not going to necessarily want to negotiate better pricing. So we, we can use that ranking um, to sort of work out what, a, what actually do we want to say. So the leverage over the companies trumps the transparency with the public? Well, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, 
we want to work down that list. Well, we want to fund medicine. You didn't medicines. like the way that question well, was it's, characterized. Well, it's quite simplistic. But, well, yeah. it's true, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, the, we, the people know that it's got a positive recommendation. It, it goes in with all the other medicines waiting to fund it. Pompeii um, is another rare disease where advocates are pushing for funding mm -hmm. of it. Um, why did Pharmac fund a drug for infantile onset of Pompeii in December of 2016 when there are no infants with Pompeii in New Zealand? Well, there, there, there could be. A, ch children could turn up um, or be diagnosed, so it's available if, if, if a child was to present with that condition, it's there. Is anyone claiming it? I don't know, I'm sorry. Because your committee, the last I read, said that there was, quote, there are currently no patients on treatment. No. But there could be patients that present at any time. So, so you funded a drug that no one... At that particular moment in time, yes. there wasn't anyone. But, I mean, a child could present tomorrow and, and yeah. need access but to it. But there are 10 adults with Pompeii, which is a d devastatingly debilitating, debilitating illness. So, again, we rely on the evidence that the evidence in the infantile group was much better evidence than in the adult. Yeah, but uh, does it seem a bit strange to you that you funded a drug for infants? There are no infants with Pompeii. There are 10 adults in dreadful conditions with Pompeii in New Zealand, and you didn't fund it for adults. Well, it's, it's a different condition. A lot of these conditions, if you present in, in childhood, they're different um, types of disease to presenting in adulthood. So... That's the advice we get from the clinicians, looking at the, the clinical evidence in these different patient groups. Lung cancer is the biggest cancer killer, mm -hmm. yet when the Lung Cancer Foundation has looked at the top five cancer meds and the cost of Pharmac of $122 million, the top three cancer drugs, just $2.7 million, or 2.3% of that total spent on those top five cancer drugs, they call this, quote, a staggering imbalance. What's your response to that? Well, I guess we don't, we don't fund based on proportions. We look at the evidence, we look at the medicines, and there are a lot of new medicines for lung cancer coming through, and our oncology our committee that met last week certainly looked at um, a lot of these medicines, mm -hmm. both first line and second line yeah. um, lung cancer treatment. Did you look at uh, Pemetrexid, for example? Mm -hmm. Now, you funded it in 2017, didn't you? Uh, yep. 13 years after Australia. Well, we'd been funding it through our exception scheme for most of the patients that needed it um, through the, the ACC. Um, yeah, but not Zoom. funding it for, for general patients on lung cancer, though. For 13 years. So what? Did, so did you get it wrong for 13 years? No, I mean, as I said, it, nothing, it was never declined. It was there waiting to be funded. The evidence um, for the price that was being asked, what, you there just, wouldn't be You better. just weren't pre prepared to pay the money for it. Well, there's always other things that are higher up the list to be funded. Yeah, but 1,900 people a year die from mm, lung cancer. I know, yeah. 1,900. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is many of these patients present very late with very advanced lung cancer. They're often at stage four when they present. So again, I, I come back to my point that we're part of a wider health system. Treatment for cancer isn't all about medicines. No. It's about screening. It's about diagnosis. Can can medicines are about 8 to 10% of cancer control. The most effective things to manage cancer are screening, diagnosis, radiotherapy and surgery. Medicines make up 8 to 10% of cancer yeah, control. Yeah, but they can buy you years though, can't they? Well, some can, some can't, and that's what we have to work out. Yeah, and you're comfortable to wait 13 years behind Australia to fund a drug like that? Well, that's we funded other medicines in the meantime. Mm. Keytruda is funded for melanoma, but mm -hmm. not for lung cancer. Why is that's, that? Well, that's going through, that was um, being assessed by our, our uh, oncology committee. So it uh, might be. Well, it's in the pile with everything else. Yeah, there are. A, a, this is a huge area with the immunotherapies coming through, and many of them have got multiple um, indications across many different cancers. We have though ended up with a two-tier system, though, haven't we? If you want crizotinib which in some cases can add months and years on to lives. And there are patients that we know of in New Zealand who are five years clear using crizotinib. If you can pay your 13000 a month for that, which is out of the reach of many, you could live for a few more years and watch your kids grow up. And if you can't, you die. Well, 
There's lots of examples like that, and that is difficult. And you know, we we hear all these patients. Yeah. But do, so, do you accept there is a two tier system? Well, yeah. I don't think it's a two tier well, system. Well, it is. It's the rich and the poor. Well, you could say that for lots of things. Well, do you agree <laughs> in this case? Well, I don't because I think you know we we have to we have to make the decisions about what's the best use of the, of the medicine we've got. If people choose to go and fund medicines themselves, then that's their choice. A lot of people choose to do that. A lot of people have insurance policies to do that. It's like having elective surgery on insurance. You can choose whether to do that rather than going into the yeah, public but if, system. But, but if you're a low income unit, yeah, that's not going to be a choice. Absolutely. And and this is the this is the medical environment that we've got, the medicines environment we've got, isn't it? But I'd come back to we're part of a much broader health system, and funding cancer medicines is just part of the story. There's much bigger issues around screening, particularly in Maori and Pacific Islands. They are they're presenting much late at a much later diagnosis because they're they're not accessing screening services for whatever reason. So I think, you know, we're hopeful that the cancer action plan that's coming, that we'll be part of that, and we become part of a broader system solution to these issues. Mm -hmm.